Ask any physician and they'll tell you that pattern hair loss, also known as androgenic alopecia, is a genetic hair loss disorder. But did you know that genetically identical twins can bald at different rates, some faster and some slower? Well, if androgenic alopecia is genetic, then how is this possible? Well, we're gonna answer that exact question. This video is gonna dive into three studies on male and female twins and how this information may reveal strategies that we can actually use to help slow down hair loss, even outside of the drug model. It's all coming up. This is Rob from Perfect Hair Health, and in this video, we are going to be diving into research showing that genetically identical twins, people who carry the exact same gene sets, can actually go bald at different rates. In fact, at least three separate studies have found across twins that certain environmental, lifestyle, and maybe even dietary choices appear to be linked to a faster progression of male and female pattern hair loss. And if we take the time to actually understand why this might be happening and how these findings fit really well into what we already know about the way that androgenic alopecia advances, we can use this video not just as an educational opportunity, but also as a chance to talk about how simple everyday changes to our lifestyle, to our environment, they might actually help us to slow down the balding process. Before we get into things, if you are fighting hair loss and you're feeling overwhelmed by all of the chaos and the conflicting advice online, feel free to sign up for my email course. I'm a medical editor, I'm a study author with five peer-reviewed publications on hair loss disorders, and the course is designed to help kickstart you toward a path toward hair regrowth and on your terms. We'll uncover natural and conventional interventions, their quality of evidence, case studies showcasing the power of multi-targeting and why there is no one-size-fits-all solution to hair thinning. Back to these twin studies. The first is out of Japan, and it looked at 11 pairs of male twins with androgenic alopecia. 10 of these 11 pairs had done no prior hair loss treatments before the study. These investigators took photo assessments of all twins at their first appointment. And they actually found that five pairs of these twins, that's nearly 50% of the twin sets in this study, showed moderate to significant differences in their rates of balding. I mean, just check out these photos. That's twin number one, and that's twin number two. Again, these are twins who have done no prior hair loss treatments. That's a big difference in hair density. And here's another photo set. That's twin number one and twin number two. And again, twin number one, and twin number two. The investigators then put these twins on medical treatments like finasteride to see if they would converge toward the same hair count improvements. And many of these men responded very well to medical treatment, but unfortunately the differences between twins, they more or less remain the same. So the researchers concluded that environmental factors outside of genetics, well, they might be accelerating the balding process for certain twins. Though with so few twins in this data set, they couldn't really take their suggestions any further than a hypothesis. Now, it's a very interesting study, but we have to point out two big limitations. First, only some of these twins did genetic testing. So while the investigators presumed that they were identical, and while they all fit that phenotype, we actually can't say for sure that this is the case for every single twin. So let's not overstate anything here. And secondly, while these researchers cataloged some lifestyle habits, like smoking and alcohol use, and then tried to correspond those to degrees of hair loss, since they were only dealing with 11 pairs of twins, they weren't really able to determine any links between these habits and then the different rates of balding. Nonetheless, they still felt that these photographs, these results, they demonstrated enough evidence to suggest that epigenetics, or the interaction between our genes and our environments, they were probably playing some sort of role in slowing down or speeding up the balding process between twins. And the good news is that around the same time that this study was published back in 2013, two more studies came out to support this exact assertion. Both were on identical twins, both were better designed, and both had large enough sample sizes to really dig deeper into that environmental and lifestyle situation that might or might not correlate with the acceleration of the balding process. So let's dig into both of these studies. The first study featured 98 identical twin females. The second study featured 92 pairs of identical male twins. In both studies, the researchers asked each twin to fill out a detailed health survey. These are questions related to their lifestyle, their pre-existing conditions, their stress levels, their marital status, their number of children, their sleeping schedule, alcohol and smoking consumption, literally dozens and dozens of factors, including, and most importantly, the past use of hair loss products which I actually emailed the investigators to confirm over email. Then the researchers took high quality photographs of each twin using a standardized set of camera angles. 
distances, and scalp segments, the hairline, the crown, and a few other places. Then the researchers had another person, someone blinded by the survey results, come in to look at these photographs to assess each twin's hair loss, including an analysis from a measurement software to quantify the differences between twins more granularly. Then these investigators ran a series of regression models to test for links between each twin's survey results and their degree of balding. So really interesting study design. Now, in both studies, the researchers organized their survey results by scalp regions and by hair loss severities across and between each twin set. So there are literally dozens and dozens of findings, so we're not gonna discuss all of them in this video. If you're curious, I'll link both of the studies below. But for this video, we wanna focus on the topic at hand, which would be the inter-twin effects. In other words, the differences in the degree of hair loss between each twin set and how those differences reflect on the survey answers. So first, the researchers found, just like in that earlier study, that each twin could go bald at different rates. This was true in both identical females and identical males. So between each twin, the question then becomes, what sort of environmental or lifestyle habits appeared to be linked to higher degrees of balding? Between female twins, more frontal hair loss was observed in those who had reported multiple marriages, hypertension, history of smoking, or who reported relatively higher amounts of everyday stress. More temporal hair loss was seen in twins who were reportedly divorced or separated from their spouses or had a cancer diagnosis or who were current smokers. Between male twins, more frontal hair loss was observed in the twin who had a longer history of smoking and higher amounts of dandruff. More temporal hair loss was observed in the twin who drank more than four alcoholic drinks per week reportedly. More vertex hair loss was observed in the twin who reported longer durations of stress and who smoked. And in many twin sets, these effects and the survey data, well, they were incredibly obvious. Just see these two twins. This twin reported much higher degrees of stress over a lifetime, and interestingly enough, it looks like he's got a lot more hair loss. And then there are these twins. This twin drank less alcohol and didn't smoke. This twin drank four or more drinks weekly and was a regular smoker. And as we can see, there's a significant difference in the degree of hair covering their crown or the vertex, despite having the same exact genetic profile. Now, again, I'm not showing all of the study findings here because there are a lot, and some of them, in my opinion, are a little bit misleading, and they might more so reflect something known as reverse causality rather than actionable insights. So please go through the studies yourself, check them out. The important thing here is that in all three of these studies, the investigators controlled for a history of hair loss product use, and they clearly demonstrated across identical twin sets that certain lifestyle and environmental factors were more strongly correlated with higher rates of balding than others. So the next question becomes, why? Why is this the case? I mean, you hear from nearly everyone that androgenic alopecia is a genetically inherited hair loss disorder. So how is it that one twin can go bald much faster than his or her genetically identical counterpart? If it's genetic, then shouldn't lifestyle not really matter at all? Well, not so fast. In my opinion, there is a big insight here. It's something that a lot of people miss and that it's something that we can actually leverage to our advantage if we understand a little bit more about how androgenic alopecia progresses. So first, androgenic alopecia, or AGA for short, it's this hair loss disorder that is absolutely driven by hormones and genetics. In fact, there are studies implicating over 200 genes in its development. But this hair loss disorder has a very unique and defining characteristic. And that's hair follicle miniaturization. This is when each individual hair strand, it gets thinner and thinner over time until eventually the hair is so thin that it barely grows out of the surface of the skin at all, at which point you're dealing with what looks like a bald scalp. In other words, miniaturization is one of the key ways that androgenic alopecia actually progresses. So how does miniaturization happen? Or more importantly, when does it happen? Well, a lot of people presume that it happens actively as a hair is continuing to grow, but that's actually not true. In androgenic alopecia, if you measure hairs affected by this hair loss disorder at the tip and all the way down to the root, you'll find that these hairs hold the same exact diameter. So if they're not miniaturizing as they're growing, when does the miniaturization occur? It actually occurs between hair cycles and through hair shedding. Now, our hair cycle is this ever-repeating process where our hair grows for between two to seven years, then it 
disconnects from its blood supply, then the hair sheds out and the old follicle collapses and then a new follicle regenerates to take its place. And then that starts to produce a new hair and the process repeats and repeats and repeats forever until we eventually die. But with hairs affected by androgenic alopecia, something goes wrong. When that old hair sheds out and the old follicle degenerates and then a new one comes in to take its place, specific hormones like dihydrotestosterone and proteins like transforming growth factor beta one, well, these things attach to the newly forming hair follicles and they damage its base. And that reduces its ability to resize as effectively. So in the next hair cycle, we end up generating a slightly smaller hair follicle than the previous hair cycle. And that smaller hair follicle, well, it produces a slightly thinner hair strand. And then that hair eventually grows out and sheds and the process of miniaturization repeats and repeats and repeats until eventually, again, the hair gets so thin that it barely grows out of the surface and we barely see it at all. So this step process for hair follicle miniaturization, it's unique to androgenic alopecia and it provides us with a key insight. No hair shedding, no miniaturization, no progression of androgenic alopecia. Now, unfortunately, our hair cycle is ongoing constantly and so it's normal for us to shed 100 plus hairs daily even in the absence of a hair loss problem. So some shedding is normal, some shedding is expected, some shedding is completely unavoidable. In the absence of treatment, for the majority of people, miniaturization will still occur because we can't turn off shedding entirely. But on the other side of the spectrum, we can accelerate shedding. We can inadvertently speed up the rate at which we shed hairs, which will actually increase the opportunities for that miniaturization process to occur and occur more frequently. And increased rates of shedding, they actually happen because of another type of hair loss called telogen effluvium. And I know this is a long-winded explanation, I promise we'll get to the point soon. So telogen effluvium essentially occurs when some sort of negative event disrupts our hair cycle, such that more than 20% of our hairs in our scalp, they enter the shedding stage, also known as the telogen stage of the hair cycle. This can occur due to literally hundreds of factors, but the big ones relate to stressful events, seasonality of our hair cycle, like sunlight exposure, chronic conditions like hypothyroidism, micronutrient deficiencies. Again, the list is massive. There are even certain drugs that can trigger this condition. I've made videos on this topic where I dive really, really deep into telogen effluvium, and I even describe how marketers manipulate its definition to do things like cheat clinical trials. So be sure to check out those videos on this channel if you get the chance. But more importantly, I've also discussed how telogen effluvium can actually accelerate the onset of androgenic alopecia because it leads to hair shedding that unmasks androgenic alopecia. You go through a stressful event, a lot of hair starts to shed, and then when the stressful event resolves and the hair comes back, it comes back miniaturized. And all of a sudden you've got cosmetic degrees of pattern hair loss that wasn't previously there. Dozens of research groups have written about this. It's a very well understood phenomenon in the literature. So why am I referencing all of this? Well, let's reflect back to those survey findings on genetically identical twins. For male and female twin sets, which behavioral characteristics tended to be linked to one twin balding faster than the other? Multiple marriages, divorce or separation, higher levels of everyday stress, smoking, hypertension, dandruff, and a bunch of other factors. Well, guess what? All of these things are considered triggers for telogen effluvium-based sheds. High levels of everyday stress, divorce, multiple marriages, we can categorize all of these things as stressful events, which we know, according to the literature, trigger telogen effluvium, even when the stress occurs on a gradient. It doesn't have to be super severe. It can be moderate but persistent. For example, stress from lockdowns have triggered telogen effluvium, according to new studies. Or the jobs that make us work more than 52 hours per week, where we've seen in the data that individuals who work more while controlling for other lifestyle factors and even income, they tend to seek out androgenic alopecia treatments more often than those working fewer hours. And the presumption behind that is increased shedding. Then there's data that while smoking might not increase the prevalence of androgenic alopecia, it actually does increase its severity. The hypothesis here is that smoking increases oxidative stress. And we know that high degrees of oxidative stress, well, that can lead to excessive hair shedding, which again, creates more opportunities for hair follicle miniaturization. Then there's the data on dandruff, which we know in excess is often a symptom of a microorganism overgrowth in the scalp. These microorganisms like piacnes or malassezia, they induce inflammation, which induces hair shedding. And you can even see that in clinical studies, when you resolve the inflammation from these microorganisms, hair shedding rates decrease. 
And androgenic alopecia outcomes also improve. That's why we have antimicrobial shampoos like 2% ketoconazole. I even made a video about this, which I'll also provide a link to. You can check it out. So what does all of this suggest? Well, these twins, some of them are probably balding faster than their other counterpart because they're probably undergoing higher rates of hair shedding, as evidenced by the fact that their survey responses correlate very closely to the known triggers of telogen effluvium. So it's no wonder why years and years of excessive shedding can accelerate differences in androgenic alopecia outcomes across twins that over a couple months might not look like anything, but over a series of years will look like this, or this, or this. The more shedding, the more opportunities for miniaturization, the faster our androgenic alopecia will actually progress. So what is the key takeaway? It's really simple. Take steps to normalize your hair shedding. That is it. If you can, try to avoid any dietary, any lifestyle, any environmental habits that may lead to excessive hair shedding. Minimize your stress, maintain adequate nutrient levels, avoid smoking, try not to drink in excess, try to make your divorces as peaceful as possible. I know that's a big ask, but you catch my drift. The goal here is to avoid the things that trigger lots of hair shedding, and in doing so, help to normalize that hair cycle, slow down the progression of androgenic alopecia to its normal pace, and experience miniaturization that is at a normal rate. In my personal experience, identifying and resolving these things often makes other hair loss treatments you're pursuing far, far more effective. And again, if you want help with this, check out the video that we already made on telogen effluvium. It'll give you a massive list of triggers and the health symptoms that are often associated with those triggers and what you can do about them. So that's basically it. And before we wrap this up, it's worth mentioning that this is only my interpretation of the data. The investigators running these studies were referencing, yes, they had lots of results to explain. And while they touched on some of the points that I just raised, their results discussions, they tended to focus on other findings from their studies. So give them a full read. Let me know what you think in the comments. I also feel like I need to emphasize again that I'm not saying we can avoid androgenic alopecia by reducing stress or quitting smoking. If it isn't already clear, making lifestyle changes that help normalize hair shedding is not equivalent to eliminating hair shedding. The data support the former, not the latter. And this distinction, I think it's really important because while most people watching this channel seem to know this and they seem to get it, in my short time on YouTube, I've learned that there is this weird market for reaction videos where people will take your own videos or your own interviews, then they'll hyperbolize what you're actually saying. They'll exaggerate all of your words and your positions. They'll tell people that you said things you never did, and then they'll attack you for opinions you never held to satisfy their own cravings for attention. So I have to put these disclaimers on the videos for now and for the foreseeable future. In any case, I hope this video helps. So. Check out our Telogen Effluvium video for more information. And again, if you want to get started and you want to get serious about fighting hair loss, check out our free email course. Or if you're looking for personalized support from me, one of our team members, feel free to join our membership community. This is where we offer personalized support to anybody fighting hair loss and looking to navigate their sea of treatment options. Thanks again. I'll see you next week.